Hello, dear audience. Welcome to the post-screening discussion for In Balanchine's Classroom, which is co-presented with the Houston Ballet. You guys are in for a treat. So I am gonna go ahead and introduce our incredible moderator, Connor Walsh, principal dancer from the Houston Ballet. Um, and he's going to introduce the rest of the speakers. And I'll just say a couple of things about Connor. Um, Connor is from Fairfax, Virginia. He began training at the age of seven under the direction of his mother, Constant Walsh. And um, he trained at the Kurov Academy of Ballet, the Harid Conservatory, Houston Ballet's Ben Stevenson Academy. Um, and he has performed many, many lead roles in many ballets, many solo roles. He has danced major roles. He has danced the choreography of Balanchine, of Jerome Robbins, of Justin Peck. It goes on and on and on. In recent years, um, Connor has expanded his reach into teaching, coaching, and choreography. And in 2015, along with Houston um, Ballet Company members, um, he founded Reach, fellow company members Reach, a choreo choreographic project that raises money for arts education in schools. So we are so excited to have this Renaissance man moderate this conversation. And I'm going to cede the stage to Connor. Thank you so much, Connor, for joining us and enjoy the conversation, everybody. It should be amazing. Thank you so much, Jessica. And um, thank you everyone for being here and welcome. I am so excited to speak with um, three incredible women. Um, one is director Connie Hockman. The other is a former New York City Ballet ballerina, Meryl Ashley, and also a longtime friend and fellow colleague at Houston Ballet, Allison Miller. Um, as much as I am just wanna jump into a conversation, these, um, this panel deserves a proper introduction. So bear with me as I read through or stumble through their bios perhaps. Um, but I hope, I just would like everyone to get to know who we're talking with today. First, we have our director, Connie Hockman. Um, she was a professional dancer with the Pennsylvania Ballet where she performed many Balanchine masterworks. In 2007, Connie began a series of interviews with former Balanchine dancers, 90 in all, to explore the phenomenon of Balanchine's classroom. Why did he teach and not just choreograph? What did he teach? How did he teach? How did his daily class relate to his ballets? Their remembrances of his unorthodox methods and transformative teaching from the basis of in Balanchine's classroom. In addition to these oral histories, Connie launched an extensive and painstaking search for visuals that would bring this story to life. Over the years, she discovered a trove of never before seen archival footage of Balanchine in America. With approval from the George Balanchine Trust, Connie traveled around the country and to Europe to film Balanchine's former dancers staging his ballets, teaching his class and passing on their knowledge to today's generation. Well, welcome, Connie. Thanks so much. I'm going to also introduce our next guest, Meryl Ashley, who um, I've had the joy of working with and I'm just excited to catch up with um, virtually here today. But for those of you who don't know, Meryl Ashley uh, is an iconic former ballerina who uh, spent 31 years dancing with the New York City Ballet. She was considered one of the great Balanchine ballerinas, and she now helps keep his legacy alive by staging his ballets for companies around the world. Ashley was born in St. Paul, Minnesota and raised in Rutland, Vermont, where she began her ballet studies at age seven. That's when I started dancing as well, seven. In 1964, at the age of 13, she was awarded a scholarship to continue her dancing at the School of American Ballet as part of its Ford Foundation Scholarship. In 1967, George Balanchine invited Ashley to join the Corps de Ballet of the New York City Ballet, where she soon appeared in both core and soloist roles in almost all of the ballets in the company's repertoire. In 1974, she was promoted to the rank of soloist, and three years later, she became a principal dancer after a career of 31 years in New York City Ballet. Ashley danced her final performance with the company as part of the opening night benefit in 1997. Um, I could go on and on and on with Meryl Ashley's achievements, and I'm gonna save a lot of those for the conversation later, um, but thank you so much for joining us today, Meryl. Oh, well, it's great to be with you and see you again, Connor. I wish yeah. I was in person, but. <laughs> <laughs> likewise, uh, likewise. But it's the second best. Yeah. And our last guest is a, a colleague of mine at Houston Ballet, Allison Miller, who's originally from St. Petersburg, Florida. Allison Miller is a first soloist with the Houston Ballet uh, growing up, she studied ballet in Ellington, Florida, 
with Diane Partington until the age of 15 when she left Florida to attend the North Carolina School of the Arts. There she worked closely with Melissa Hayden, also a renowned former New York City ballet principal who danced many of Balanchine's ballets. Allison then joined American Ballet Theater Studio Company in New York City in 2004, and then Houston Ballet in 2006. At Houston Ballet, she danced soloist roles and leading roles in many ballets, including one choreographed originally by George Balanchine on Merrill Ashley, Ballo della Regina. Also, Serenade, Flower Festival, Don Quixote, Spring Waters, Swan Hilda and Capella, and many more things. Um, Allison is also a, a true talent and collaborator in Houston, as costume designer and uh, costume advisor, and just all around amazing person. So I am just so thrilled to have th these three wonderful women with us. Um, thank you so much for being here. And uh, I'm gonna start by talking with Connie. I just, I would love to know, uh, because you're the only person I've never actually met. And I, I wanna say first, congratulations on this spectacular film. Um, it's really, it's a gift to the ballet world, I think. It's a gift to uh, people who love ballet, who love Balanchine's work, um, and I, I think it will hold an important place in history of, of remembering this, this iconic man's work. Um, but first, can you, as a former dancer, can you just give us a little bit more background of yourself and what led you to um, directing a film? You know, I can't imagine that leap myself. So could you give us a, a little bit of that arc and how we got there? Yes, I'll, I will try. Um, <laughs> that, that question, um, more and more when I'm asked it, I think of what Balanchine said in the in the movie, uh, inspiration, that high class word. It's where you were born, what you've done in your life. Um, you know, it's it's a cumulative thing. It's not one one uh, event or but um, you know, as a child I got to be around him a lot. Uh, at the school of American ballet, he was staging, he's putting his nutcracker on the big new stage at New York State Theater and Midsummer Night's Dream, I got to be around him a lot and observe him. And I got to observe the dynamic between him and his dancers. And I got to watch his dancers dance over the years I was in uh, School American Ballet, eight or nine years. And then I went on to dance at Pennsylvania Ballet and dance his ballets. I did not get into New York City Ballet. That was a big thing. I wanted to dance for Balanchine. I wanted to have more to do with him. And um, But when I did dance his ballets, which was incredible, um, I was coached by one of his trained dancers, uh, former New York City Ballet dancer, <clears throat> Robert Rodham. And and then I, I got to... Um, have a lot to do with different, um, as I retired and taught, I had more to do with others, other dancers trained by Balanchine. And every time I, I got to work with them, either as a dancer, as a teacher, I really, beyond a shadow of a doubt, I could see that they had special knowledge, knowledge of the body, knowledge of technique, knowledge of, of expression, artistry, they had something and I remembered back talking to my friends at School of American Ballet as they were getting into the company. I, um, I would ask them about this morning class that Balanchine taught. Somehow we heard he was teaching a morning class regularly every day. And we had gone through the school together. We had the same hard teachers, famous teachers, Alexandra Danilova and Tomkovsky and Stanley Williams and just many, many of his tan chosen teachers. And we, they were hard. We're, our training was great. But somehow when my friends got into the company and got to t take Balanchine's class and I asked them about it, they wouldn't talk to me. They clammed up. They shut down. And they meant it. And, and we had gone, gone through the school together for years. We knew each other well. We were a family. And they knew I really wanted to hear about it. And they just wouldn't. So that was a clue. Why would Balanchine teach every day? He was very deliberate with his time. He didn't waste time. He wouldn't waste anything. I mean, he would turn off the lights at the end of the day at the theater. He was so conscious with time and um 
economy and and yet the dancers wouldn't talk about it what happened in that class so that's that really um just stimulated my curiosity till one day i had to find out and started these interviews and then it started coming together that's amazing so i i read that this film took 10 years to make and i mean that is i've never t worked on a project that's lasted longer than a year so i can't imagine um, the it, amount of challenges, the emotional roller coaster that must be. Um, could you speak about two things? One is, I would love to know what your greatest revelations were throughout this film. You know, you seem like you, you went in with a clear um, goal, a clear I idea of what you wanted to discover. Um, what were the what was different, what was the biggest surprise? But also I'd love to know some of the biggest challenges as somebody who's not in the film industry, who's never made a film. Um, could you talk a little bit about some of the unexpected challenges as well? Um, I feel that I can say very point blank that there was not one part of making this film that was not an intense, extreme challenge, except the motivation, the, 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 the motivation to keep going. The motivation to keep going was never a challenge because I was working with this material that was just like a fountain of, of inspiration and just edifying and fascinating. Talking to people like Meryl Ashley, you know, one Balanchine dancer after another, and then finding the footage of Balanchine and, you know, the audio of Balanchine and just delving into it. So that just, it was just constant um, motivation and reason to keep going, but everything else was challenging. Everything. I mean, the rights and licensing, the fundraising, the finding the story. I mean, I did 90 interviews, interviews with 90 dancers and then interviews with 10 people who worked with Balanchine, one, uh, one of his pianists, um, one of his set and stage designers, people who worked closely with him, who felt he mentored them with their own craft. Um, so how do you make a story with that many voices? How do you choose characters? Uh, how do you even learn the art of filmmaking? I went pretty deep into ballet as a dancer. And then I started seeing that filmmaking has its own in very involved technique. And um, so, yeah, every, everything was challenging and overwhelming. But I don't doubt it. And I'm, I imagine you had a lot of collaborators along the way as you're learning, as you're learning this new craft. Could you, there's some special people that you'd like to um, uh, tell us about that sort of helped you learn this, learn this craft? Um, well, the first person I always acknowledge is my husband, Mark, who was um, the person who, who, who kept me going and it going um, when the going gets got rough. Just make your film, make your film, and we'll find a way. Um, so Mark Hockman. But um, many of the Balanchine dancers or a handful of them became my kind of soulmate partners, you know, confidant and handholders and um, Meryl, Meryl being one of them, um, Suki Shore. Uh, um, but um, my editors, film, film editors are unsung heroes. They have to translate the, the director's, you know, vision and thoughts and, and uh, they have to learn the language, you know, filmmaking like dance, very hard to talk about a visual, a visual, um, you know, visual storytelling and yet the other dimensions of sound and music and timing. So editors um, have to be storytellers. And, and in my case, they had to be patient as I was learning the art of filmmaking. Mm. I could go on and on. Huge collaboration. Um, huge. Well, that's the perfect segue to bring in one of your fantastic collaborators in this, Meryl Ashley who, um, you know, as listening to you talk about that, Connie, I was like, oh, let's just talk to all of those people. What a thrill that must have been. You know, 90 former dancers and, or, or 90 people, that's amazing. Mm -hmm. um, Mayor, what, there is so much footage in there that I've never seen. I mean, it, I mean that's one of the gifts well, I think. I've never is to seen get, either. <laughs> I, I believe it. I'm sure there's footage of us at Houston Valley that I've never seen. But what, you know, 
I mean, one, first, it was amazing to see Balanchine working, to see his physicality, to listen to his voice, to listen to his patterns of how he communicated, all of that amazing imagery, which I, I want to talk a little bit more about later. But what was that like for you looking at some of the most important moments of your life and hearing all these fellow dancers um, t tell these stories together? I mean, it, these are, those are important moments in your career and, and, and in your life, I imagine. Um, what was that like, sort of seeing that come together on, on the screen? Well, I think it was, uh, I mean, my first reaction was just my heart was filled with joy and such wonderful memories and hearing, you know, I mean, a lot of those people I talk to all the time, but I didn't know some of the stories they told. And then the other part of it was also heartbreaking because it's an era that's gone and will never, in my, I, I can't imagine that it will ever come back in in anything close to that. I just can't can't imagine it. And I, I feel um, sad for, for dancers today that they don't have that same kind of stimulation and nurturing and um, example. Because if you just watched him, you got, he was the best example of, of everything. Uh, from the way he showed steps to the way he treated people to the way he behaved, he didn't raise his voice. He he knew he let you know when he was unhappy, but uh, but it was always in a gentlemanly way and a, a respectful way. He he loved his dancers and he respected us and he so we were kind of like a big family to him, and that is something that just doesn't seem to exist anymore. And I think it's uh, was instrumental in creating what he created and the way we developed. So um, it's it's something that's, that I feel has been lost and it's, it's quite sad to me you know, anyway. <laughs> that's, well, that's it. I definitely wanted to talk about this, um, this idea of, of um, continuing Balanchine's legacy, right? And that's something that you have now uh, yourself, you are doing, you're trying to, to pass on um, his message, his words, his his dances. But something that I found really interesting in the film is, and I, I've experienced this in the studio as well, is, you know, lots of people have different experiences and remember things differently. And um, how, as a stager and as a coach, do you navigate um, trying to pass on uh, what you think or what is important to Balanchine, right? Like, how, it's... You know, it's not just do this step here and that step here on this count there and that count there. That's not what made him special, right? And that's so much no, of what this no. film showed us, right? Um, could you talk a little bit about your process of that responsibility, of carrying that responsibility and, and taking that into the studio with the next generation? Uh, well, it's it's always a big problem. Uh, I mean, first you do have to decide on the steps, uh, but you also have to look at the dancers in front of you because all the stages know there were different versions of different things, but the, the most important thing from my point of view is that the essence of the ballet, the mood of the ballet, even though there's no story, there's a mood, there is emotion that's being conveyed. Um, and how do you respect the dancers in front of you, bring out what they can offer individually to the ballet because we're all different people and we move differently. And yet the ballets, the steps are most effective when they're done in the way that he taught us to do them. <laughs> so there's this funny dichotomy of having to be insistent about a certain technique, mm. a certain way of moving, and yet trying to maintain the dancer's individuality. And it's an artistic decision. And uh, it's a big challenge and it's a, it's a burden in a certain way, but it's one that, you know, he looked at all of us with his own eyes. He saw our strengths, our weaknesses, um, our, our special qualities that he, that nobody else had. And he wanted to bring that out. And so that we were all doing the same thing, but we were all different. And that's my goal is to make you stay you, but within the framework that he created. Um, and that, it's very hard. It's very hard. Yeah, Connie, I'm going to swing it back to you for a second. Um, there is a, 
a stereotype of what people think a Balanchine dancer is. And maybe some things are accurate, whether it's speed, precision, you know, dynamic qualities that are innate to his work. But there's also physical stereotypes or a certain look that people associate with a Balanchine dancer. I think your, your film does a great job of sort of dispelling some of that and showing that Balanchine celebrated the individual as much as he demanded people who could, you know, execute a certain style of dancing. There was dancers of all sorts of sizes with all sorts of different abilities. Um, yeah, could you could you speak to that a little bit of through your conversations with dancers uh, that, that worked with him? Yes, um, such a great question, Connor. All your questions are wonderful. <laughs> um, I interviewed dancers um, from one in the original cast of Serenade, 1934, Yvonne Patterson. She was in her 90s. We did two interviews. She was sharp and 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 still and still starry eyed about Balanchine. Um, and and many of the dancers before New York City Ballet was even established, dancers from Ballet Caravan and Ballet Society and Ballet Russe, all the all the companies he worked with before he could actually start New York City Ballet. All the way through the last dancers, he some of the last dancers he chose for New York City Ballet. And what I saw is that as long as he could work with dancers who were dedicated, who would meet him halfway and really be present and work hard and just be enthralled with ballet and he loved dancers so much. He was so happy to be working with dancers. And the body wasn't that important. You know, the bodies in the, four, in the 30s, 40s, 50s were very different than, than the bodies that, were, that he worked with in the 60s, 70s. Um, and and, and, and that, that wasn't, um, it, it wasn't a type he was after. He just wanted to develop the potential of the dancers there. He wanted to develop them. And he, with each generation, he saw where ballet could go. And with those specific bodies and their, their abilities, their gifts, individual gifts, and from physicality to expression. So, um, yeah, I think as he went on and Tanakil Leclerc looked a certain way, I think he got very interested in, in, in height and length um, and, and what, what tondus, how tondus develop muscle tone, you know, this kind of long, not bunchy muscles, but elongated. And because in his ballets, they became more legible. They were clearer, you know, with, with more height. But then he always had his little, his little dancers too, he, who he adored always. So it wasn't, it wasn't a type. It was um, first the music and then, then the, um, what the individual, as Meryl was saying, could bring and He worked with that potential. That's, I think, what, um, what inspired his creativity, the quirky it, individual. I think Meryl and, and Allison, you guys could agree to this, that that's sort of the gift of working with a choreographer regularly is the choreographer can create to the people that are in front of them, you know, they can, they can bring things, um, they can highlight their abilities rather than, you know, trying to make this dancer fit into this hole, they can create something for that dancer. Um, let me, I'll, I'll, I'll talk a little, I wanna go to Allison in a second, but I wanna take that moment to ask what it was like, Meryl, to have Balanchine um, create a work for you. Um, speaking of something that is tailored to you or, or your qualities or how he wanted to challenge you as a dancer. Um, could you speak a little bit about his process and that experience as a dancer um, to be in a, have a balancing work created on you? Well, that was my dream come true. <laughs> uh, but also I was nervous because I, I wanted to live up to his expectations mm. and I wanted it to be uh, a ballet that would would last, that wouldn't just be, oh, a season or two and it's not so good. And you know, then I would have let him, in my opinion, I would have let him down. Um, and certainly Balo uh, was a ballet that catered to my to everything that I did the best, which was speed and clarity. 
of movement um, and joy, the expression of joy of dance. Uh, but he challenged me uh, a lot and told um, at one point, Peter Martins told me this story that, that he went to Peter and, and Balanchine went to Peter and said, oh, I gave her all these steps I thought she couldn't do and now she's doing them. And so he was surprised too. But he also gave me steps I couldn't do and that we eventually changed slightly. And when he did his second ballet for me uh, called Ballad, um, it was very much a ballet to push me to develop another side of myself. It was much more lyrical, but it was at high speed, which is kind of an oxymoron <laughs> to be lyrical at high speed. <laughs> and um, so that was in one, I, I felt in one way he was trying to help me be comfortable because he was giving me things that were speedy, but at the same time, pushing me to develop that other side of me. And uh, I think he did that with many dancers. Um, Suzanne Farrell talks about how in the early days, he put lots of bores in all the ballets he did for her because she didn't bore well. And he, he knew that if it was in the ballet, she would work on them. Mm. And indeed, she developed beautiful bores. So it was that constant you know, his ballets teach you how to dance. Uh, if you're, you know, if you work on them enough and if he was there urging you to go in this direction and, and not another one, um, they really teach you a lot and you get to practice a lot of things. <laughs> There's no avoiding it. It is. But it's a wonderful, wonderful process. And, you know, he included me in the decision making. Dear, where do you want to come in? Which leg do you want to lift here? You know, do you... Is it all too much on your left leg? You want to do something on your right leg? You know, it was it was a collaboration. And that, I mean, he made the majority of the decisions, but um, and that's the way I preferred it. But <laughs> he wanted that. He liked that interaction. So, it, you know, again, I think it was different with every dancer. Some dancers just, he, he would let them kind of make up a step. I mean, Jacques talks about, you know, he don't even give him eight counts of turns and then leave Jacques to make up something else. <laughs> um, and so it was it was a collaboration. That's the best word I can find. Well, speaking of collaboration, I there's a well, there's, there's a quote in there that I'm going to use to kind of segue into bringing Ali into this conversation. Um, it's something that Jacques said, actually, he said, Balanchine said ballet is the art of off the ground. You don't belong on the earth with ordinary people. And I could say that uh, was very much true watching Alison Miller perform Ballo della Regina after working and collaborating with you, Meryl, in the studio. She was not hanging out with us ordinary people on the ground. <laughs> she, was, she was flying and floating and, um, you know, she definitely had the onion skin underneath her heels as Valentin <laughs> demanded. Yeah. So, uh, Ali, I, I, you know, we, we're in a company where, yes, we have an artistic director who is also a chore choreographer like Balanchine, um, but we also do really mix. We do a lot of different works here. So could you talk a, a lot of different styles, right? We're constantly switching from this to that. Could you talk about what it's like to prepare for a Balanchine ballet, um, particularly in comparison to other choreographers that we get to work with? Um, yeah. Uh, well, first of all, I just need to say, Connie, thank you for making this film. I'm such a Balanchine fan. I have all the books I've never seen. The footage was just incredible and so inspiring the way you told the story of Meryl and all these other dancers. Thank um, you. So thank you. Um, so welcome. when I know we have a Balanchine ballet coming, uh, we actually have Jules coming up in a couple of months. Um, you kind of know what you're in for. You have to get your fists a little tighter. Um, I'm kind of a technical dancer, so I, I I work in a clean way. I Not to toot my own horn, but <laughs> I, I work that way kind of in general. So it's sort of thinking about the musicality that might be coming. Um, but somebody like Meryl walks into the room and it's like she was saying earlier, there are certain steps that are set and that's what the ballet is. But it's the moments between the set steps that they get to breathe the life and the, the personality of the ballet that Balanchine gave to them. Um, and that's what makes these ballets so special and different from other choreography that we might do. Um, 
Yeah. Could you could you add a little bit on um, because you went to school at North Carolina School of the Arts where you worked with Melissa Hayden, who I know Meryl Ashley grew up watching watching, watching Melissa Hayden, you know, dance all the balancing works. Um, so you you had Melissa Hayden set Stars and Stripes on you. I think a balancing ballet. I think you told me that. Um, and then working with Meryl on ballet. Can you talk about? Is there a difference, whether it's pressure or a clarity that comes with trying to uh, dance a work that was gifted or and choreographed on that person? I would say it's definitely a little more frightening when the original <laughs> ballerina comes in to teach you their role, <laughs> mm -hmm. but in a wonderful way. There's no um, way to get closer to what the intention was. It's that's who inspired Balanchine to make the ballet, you know, it's such an honor. Um, and I think I realized that when I worked with uh, Miss Hayden, she was 80, I think, when um, she set the Liberty Bell on me. And it it's just so close to each dancer, same with Marilyn Ballo. Um, it's just so close to them. They were there in the room when it was made, you know, they got to make those decisions why it's this foot rather than this foot or how many times you tried to figure out how to go you know, faster or more or farther. Um, there's just, it's just a feeling of pride and responsibility that that person has to pass all of the information on to the next dancer. And it's so special. It's really challenging because it feels like you can never quite, quite get there um, because it was in their body. It was created for them, but it's such a gift. I've had a yeah. time in the studio with Meryl. It also sounds like that reflection of when I listen to a lot of people talk about balancing, he's constantly pushing, never satisfied. There's always, always further to go. And it, and it sounds like that, um, that mentality is brought into the studio, particularly when people feel ownership of that work. Um, is that, is that true, Meryl? Is it, is, do you feel a different level of responsibility when uh, staging Ballo to, I know we've worked on theme and variations before and, I think you also were here coaching diamonds on the uh, at the company on one point. Is there, do you feel a different pressure or responsibility or is it, it's all Balanchine's work and you know, you're, yeah. I, I think, I think with Balo, I, I think, you know, nobody knows this ballet better than me. Uh, what, what it takes internally, physically, emotionally, stamina wise. Um, so I feel pretty confident um, about whatever I'm saying. Whereas when I'm coaching Symphony in C or theme, well, I did them. I, I know what it felt like for me, but I'm not the original. And I know things changed over the years. And so, uh, and I know what I like to see. I know what I felt was exciting to see when other people, when I watched other people dance um, Symphony in C. But I, I don't have the same level of, confidence or um you know I, I i feel i can't be quite as insistent no it has to be this way when i'm doing ballets that weren't created for me um and i also don't feel i have the same kind of these little tiny insights like in balo i you know oh if you just lock your leg as tight as you can that step will be easier well i don't always know that in a role i didn't do um or that, you know, I figured out a way to do it in another ballet, but maybe it wouldn't be the right way. I don't know for somebody else it worked for me, but not, you know, I don't know. But with Balo, there is that an extra layer of confidence and um, and understanding of of what might be the most helpful tips for people and what what the the whole idea behind the ballet was. And the little little stories that he told too, um, that I pass on. Um, I think add something, and I don't know all those stories that he told over the years. I know them about Balo, because there was nobody else doing it most of the time. You know, it, only when I was injured were, were people doing it um, at New York City Ballet. Um, so I don't know their stories, I guess. But um, yeah. it's uh, it's it's just it does give you that um, more assured idea that you're saying the right thing. Yeah, I mean, particularly for a, anyone who's listening that's a non doesn't go to the ballet or doesn't do or doesn't see a lot of ballets like there are only so many steps we're doing right it's the the main difference is how we're doing them 
it's right. Or it's like, we're, we're all painting with the same colors, but it's what we do with it. And so having that imagery that Balanchine passed on that makes this arabesque different than that arabesque. It's, if I write it down on paper, it's the same step, right? But exactly. what, how a dancer approaches it and what they feel inside that Merrill can then transmit for that ballet is, is, is what makes it different. Um, Connie, I want to I, I want to jump back to you because I want to go back to those classes, <laughs> those <laughs> incredible daily classes mm -hmm. um, that Balanchine worked so hard on. You know, Allison talked a little bit about what it's like to get going and get your body into gear for a Balanchine ballet, and it's specific and it's different than for other choreographers. Um, what? In, throughout your conversations, do you have an understanding of why, well, so in some different techniques in different countries or choreographers, they've create they create a syllabus, right? Like a technique, a, a something for us to follow. You know, we I, in my class we do this step, this step, this step, and then that step. Why why do you think their Balanchine didn't um, create a syllabus or a book? you know, a Bible of Valentin's class for us to, to, to follow and to, to kind of teach his methods? Or did he? And it's just there living through the people, you know? It, what are your feelings on that after talking with so many people? Well, I mean, Mar Meryl and Suki did do um, a series called the Balanchine Essays. That's right. Mm -hmm. And Suki wrote her incredible book on uh, Suki Shore on Balanchine Technique, and Meryl wrote an incredible book mm -hmm incredible photographs um which are brilliant um but i do think that balanchine was always evolving mm -hmm. and um i mean in the interviews some of the dancers remember when he would teach let's say a ronde de jean which is a circle with the leg on the floor uh with one accent and then he changed it to no accent they they remember these these changes and um he 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 did some exploring of how to get the best result from the dancer at in that at that point you know in that generation those bodies how to get the best result how to get the from them what they could deliver and then the best result in the way the step to him looked. I, I feel from what I've learned, I never want to speak for Balanchine. I'm just interpreting what I what I've learned from the interviews, but he his training was incredible. He loved his pre-Soviet training. His imperial, imperial, imperial ballet school training. Um, and he always said he was passing on what Petty you know, everything he learned from Petty he, he felt, I think, that he didn't want to lose that, the elegance and the refinement. and um, But he did want to be able to build on it with the bodies, the dancers he was working with. He'd also explore exaggeration, you know, if how deep, how low could you go in class one day in plie? How low could you literally go into a plie? to get the ballon or how, how big could you make something or how articulate a small step. You know, he, he experimented with extremes and then, but then he would kind of for the each individual dancer, leave it up to them, almost like a recipe for their, for their dancing and their role that they were working on to come to what was right for them. So I, I think he saw it as somewhat fluid not not certain elements. Certain elements were not fluid. I told you, he knew. You know, when Merrill says in in the movie, he understood the body and you know fifth and the torque. Um, he opposition. He understood how they would get the most control, the most coordination, the most harmony in the body, the most energy. He understood certain things, but other things were individual. It comes back to that balance between these very high standards regimented high standards for certain elements that should not change, should be constant. And then how much where there was leeway. And that I feel was his greatest gift, that balance. And that's maybe why he himself, he didn't write up anything because there had to be that little give. Um, but Meryl, I feel could speak to it 
better than I because she, she was. <laughs> I looked at, well, I think at the school, there is a syllabus, um, very much so uh, for the certainly the younger classes. Um, I think Balanchine's class was not meant to be a well-balanced class. It was him looking at us, trying to push us, trying to understand us, trying to see what possibilities there were. Um, and, you know, if he saw in performance that we weren't doing a certain step well, the neck of pot de Tom Bay pot de bourree, and all its varieties, we would work on that for days. Bourrées uh, on point. Um, when he was about to do Vienna waltzes, he was giving waltzing of every variety in class. So he used it partly as a, a tool for himself, partly to teach us because he knew he was going to have a ballet that, that exposed those elements and we needed to do them beautifully. Um, so it wasn't about let's prepare the dancer for the day, let's give them a well-balanced class. And they were almost never well-balanced, never. Um, you know, the bar was 15 or 20 minutes. And then right away you were into, you know, sometimes you do grand bat in the center and, but grand plié and tendus. And then you were turning and jumping and uh, doing everything. Um, and some of it was fascinating because of the way he used musicality and he'd take the same step and put it to different music all the time. And you'd go forward and back and side and turn and up and down <laughs> every variety you could think of, which was fun, but also challenging. Um, yeah. Allison, could you tell me what were you watching those classes? You know, the, those clips of those classes. I, I know my reaction, but I'm, I'm here to ask the questions today. What were your reactions <laughs> <laughs> at some of those um those combinations and the speeds and the repetitiveness. I mean, and and consider talking to people who maybe have never taken a ballet class in their lives to give a little perspective of what is extreme about doing so many tendus and why we even would consider to do so. Right. Um, well, Meryl just mentioned the bar might be 15 minutes long. Normally a bar is 30 to 40 minutes long in a company class. Um, and then the rest of the hour, the, there's about an hour of center combinations and dancing around. And there's a progression. You you start with plies to warm up your joints and then you do gentle tendus and your legs lift higher and higher as the bar goes. And then you move to center where you have nothing to hold on to and you start turning and jumping. So so that is a little shocking to hear that you'd just be doing this or that or get stuck on one combination for so long. Um, for example, in the film, uh, there's mention of 64 tondus in each direction. We would do maybe four in each direction. <laughs> <laughs> For some perspective, <laughs> right? Yeah. Four, we're all, what? But um, I don't, yeah. I, I, I don't, I shouldn't interrupt you, but I, just when I started teaching and I'd give eight and I'd think this is nothing and everybody would groan, eight, oh my gosh. <laughs> it's amazing. I mean, it was, oh, that's easy. Right. Well, this incredible footage of seeing those classes and, and how he would stop and correct, it just made me want to see more and more of it. It it made me have questions. Well, I ha actually wanted to talk to Meryl about how he developed the point work. Connie, uh, the film mentioned how um, Balanchine really transformed women's point work and, and articulation through the foot and all these amazing things that we just are expected to do nowadays in America. But that was happening with you, Meryl. I mean, that was a great example of the complexity of point work. Um, <laughs> what was that process? Did, did that happen in ballet class or was it? It happened, you know, lots of slow releves going through the foot um, and releves on point without plie in the center on one foot. Lovely. I mean, you know, you develop a strength, you develop a an awareness of the kind of control that's required and then how you step on point and how it had, you know, he was very specific about how the edge of the shoe hit the floor and how you rolled from the edge of the shoe onto the very tip. And then of course he expanded by, by having steps where you actually fell off point on purpose. Normally you would start to roll down. So he expanded the, the possibility, but it takes understanding of how to fall and how to travel and how, so it doesn't look like you fell off point, <laughs> um, you know, out of control. Um, but that was in class. There's that one combination in the film of these slow releves. I looked at that, that, oh my Lord, <laughs> that step is so hard. 
and represented what we were doing all the time. That kind yeah. of slow, controlled releve is, um, you know, and making walks on point. We walked on point for hours yeah. and how, how to place the foot. And of course that came out in Balo at high speed. But if you didn't have the precision of how to do that and show the start and the stop of each one, it just looks like a, it doesn't look like anything. And it's supposed to be a virtuoso step. So he developed that awareness in class, absolutely. And Allison, Meryl knows that um, one, I, I do, my husband and I do want to do a version of In Balanchine's Classroom for dancers, like a three hour version, um, because there's so much. Um, when Connor, when you asked me about the challenge of the film, it was absolutely heartbreaking how little we could include in the film. I know we needed, we wanted to tell a story with drama and have a truth come out, but for dancers, the amount that we had to leave out. So we want to do a version for dancers that go into all the dancers where Balanchine gave some of the dancers a prescription for point work. Do 16 slow roll up and down, you know, every day, straight knees and he, and also toe shoes, recommending toe shoes and, and then we also want to do this archive of all the interviews complete from beginning to end so that all that information from the dancers to the to dancers of today and tomorrow so that information is not lost. I think I that is one of the most important things, Connie, that you can do. That archive is just, um, to me, I, I can't wait to see every second of it. And I think for the future, I mean, how many people have worked with a, a genius for the, you know, and and yet been able to pass on to future generations and, you know, a century from now that, that people can look at that and know what truly what Balanchine said and did straight from the mouths of the people he worked with. I, I think that's just the most incredible um, historical record possible. It's, it's unbelievable. And, and I, I applaud you for doing that because I'm sure the, you're exhausted from creating the film. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, and inspired still. That's wonderful. I look forward to the director's cut with all the extended footage. I will buy tickets in advance. That is absolutely for sure. Um, we only have a couple of minutes remaining. Um, so, uh, you know, I'm imagining that we're speaking and anyone who's watching, there's a lot of Houston based people. So I, if the people want to continue this thought and, and um, consideration of Balanchine's work and how it continues to play, I just want to remind people again that Houston Ballet is performing Balanchine's full length evening work, Jules, which Meryl and Connie and Alice can, t can t all tell you is a stunning, stunning evening of dance. Um, Absolutely. And the company will be doing that in February 24th and March 6th through March 6th for that two week period. And um, it's something we're all really, really, really looking forward to. Um, and maybe Connie, I'll, I'll give the last word to you as, as the, the director of this film and, and the, the leader of this amazing project. Um, perhaps you, you can just talk a little bit about why companies are still doing Balanchine work, why we're still talking about Balanchine, why, how immense this his influence has been on this country and really the world now. Um, I just want to give you the, the last couple words on, on on that, if you wouldn't mind. Oh my God. Um, I mean, no matter how you you delve into Balanchine, you know, whether it's talking to his dancers or going to see his ballets or watching archival footage, you never reach the end of Balanchine just from a very personal um, standpoint. Um, yes, I worked on this film for really 15 years from the time I started thinking about it, thinking it would be a book because you could cram more into a book. Um, um, and, um, you know, a lot of it was really hard, lo lonely, just brainstorming, problem solving. It's just that when it comes to Balanchine, there's so much more beauty and fascination. And he was ahead of his time while he was working, teaching, choreographing, but he's almost still ahead of his time now. 
Um, his ballets are timeless and the range of them, the breadth from, you know, symphony and C kind of neoclassical to human variations, classical to Vienna waltzes, slur on 10th Avenue, ag on Apollo. There's just such a range and breadth. You can never get to the end of his ballets. You learn about music watching his ballets. It's like a music appreciation course. Um, it's just, you never get to the end. He's, he, he teaches you, um, he expands your senses, um, and um, he fills your heart uh, with beauty, joy. Um, I, um, what he did with ballet and taking it to this new realm, you know, where it was just revolutionized and um, modern, but not losing the classical and jazzy, um, funny, um, mysterious. Um, I, and then the person himself, the man, you just, I'm still interested in him. <laughs> I haven't gotten enough. <laughs> it still makes me cry, um, and laugh with pleasure. Um, so that's just very personal to me, but I, you know, I think if each one of us spoke, um, and the audience people hearing this, I think they'd have their own reasons for why maybe they're interested in balancing and want to learn a little more and experience more. Well, thank you so much. Um, I thought after the pandemic, I was exhausted of watching dance on film. Um, <laughs> but your film, Connie, has proved otherwise. It was a real joy. And Meryl, your contribution and your words and your dancing in the film were extraordinary and I can't thank you enough um, for continuing to pass on the wisdom and, and trying to keep Balanchine's uh, art alive as, as best as possible. So thank you to you both and thank you Allison for, for joining in and I look forward to watching you do some Balanchine later on this season. Yeah. Um, also a big thank you to Houston Cinema Arts Society and Houston Ballet for presenting this film. I just, it's wonderful for the dance community to see all of this. Um, so I can't thank you all enough for this great discussion. I could go on for another two hours, but that would be very selfish of me. <laughs> all right. Thank well, you thank so much, Connor. Thank yes. you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much.